it doesn't work. And so that causes mass chaos in your auditorium. Does that happen? It can, yeah. I mean, it's Has happened. It happen? where go... All right. So my daughter is six and I asked her about 10 minutes before this interview, I said, hey, I'm talking to the guy that, you know, makes movie theaters. What do you want? me to ask him. And she said, can you ask him if I can have my own movie theater? And I said, <laughs> I said, that's actually one of my uh, our first questions. So we went to see Migration about two weeks okay. ago with the kids and awesome animated movie. And we went to see it. And I thought to myself, why has no one started a movie theater and got the movie theater license and then just made it available to stream? What's preventing that from happening? Okay. So is this, are we, is this part of yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is a great answer. So, so several years ago, and you can look this up, I think it was Sean Parker. Is that the Napster guy? I think yeah. he was trying to get a video-on-demand box kicked off. And I don't remember if this, was, if this was before or after COVID, but that was, like, to us, was terrifying, right? You pay 50 bucks, and it downloads to this box, and, and it kind of just died. And so, again, I don't remember if it was before or after COVID. I'm thinking maybe it was right before because at the time we were still kind of figuring out as an industry, what is the next five years going to look like with all this streaming? Like how all this is going to unfold. And, um, yeah, that was a big, big fear. And I think it was a combination. I mean, the outlook from our perspective, from the exhibitor side on the in- cinema side is the studios were like, we're partners, right? You make the content. We show this. You can't do this without us, and we can't do this without you. So I have a feeling it kind of they realized that it would it would upset the system a lot if they did that, right? I mean, that would take a lot of money out of our pocket and change things for us. So I think it was probably just a little bit of politics more than anything, right? Of of pushing and shoving that if y'all do that, we're gonna have a big problem here. Um, but yeah, I don't actually remember whatever ended up happening with it, but it kind of died off. But that was a very big fear there for a while that it was a a box that you could put, connect to your TV, and it would download uh, what's called first run movies straight to your home. Yeah, yeah. that's what. But that's what consumers want. Yeah, yeah, and and again, COVID. We we thought we were. We thought eventually we were going to fight this battle. I can remember vividly in 2019, we were at the, we were in LA and we were at the the National Association of Theater Owners. That's our trade association. And we were talking about, you know, Netflix and Disney Plus. Disney had just announced this thing, Disney Plus, or maybe it was just coming out and Paramount was announcing. We were like, man, over the next five years, what is going to happen? And then COVID happened. And it was like, and all of that was just immediately in home, right? Straight to the home. I think Trolls uh, mm-hmm. World Tour was the first one that was right as COVID came out, and it was like, "Wow, now we're now we're in big trouble because now things are going straight to straight to home." And as an industry, that's that's what we're fighting, right? We're fighting those streaming services now, on the entertainment side of the industry. We're fighting VR, right? The, some of the VR hardware that we use, and we as as an industry is available at home, right? It's consumer level type products. And so that's a very scary thought in that some of the best things that we have going for us, I've got to get you out of your house to come do a very similar thing here. Now, the big argument is movies are better in the movie theater, right? You're doing it with people and the sound and the video and the, the, uh, just the, everything that goes on in the production value that we can give is completely different, but there are people and we, we fight this every single day that, that don't want to do that. And if they can get it straight from uh, their streaming services, straight to, to, to in their home, that, that first run movie, they'll do it, you know, for, for whatever reason. And there's lots of reasons, but that's, that's the battle that we have to fight constantly. And we're constantly trying to figure out how we have the upper hand against that. Um, and it's not easy. I can tell you that much. No, no. All right. So first of all, I want to set the tone here. I love movies. I'm a big. That's funny because Josh guy. said the opposite. Josh said oh, he Josh wasn't a big movie fan. Josh doesn't watch movies. I can't believe he works here after <laughs> me finding that out. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, I watch a lot of movies actually, Joel. I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I get a raise? Nice yeah. save. <laughs> nice save. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it was that was actually one of the fun facts and one of our team building things that we found out that Josh has watched like five movies. I watch movies almost. I try to watch movies like every day, every week. Um, I'm huge. I specifically like like the sci-fi genre, and then of course you know kids stuff with my kids. But so I'm a big fan, and I love taking my kids to the movie theaters, and it's great because it's just a bunch of other parents in there, especially at the well for kids movies. It's great because there's a bunch of other kids in there. And what I have found, because I talk about this with my wife a lot, because we watch movies together, is there are like I like going to the movies. I like the idea of going to the movies as an experience I have in my life. But our content consumption is ramped up so drastically. That like mm-hmm. the percentage of content I watched at the movie theaters is just, it's going down, right? If you look back to when I was 15, the percentage of total content consumed, it was like between TV and then movie theaters, you know, I'd go to movies Fridays with friends. And so I'd be doing a lot of, you know, school stuff, but it, it it's, it's going down, but that doesn't, but when I see it, I know it sounds hard cause I'm talking to you and I want to <laughs> have a good call and I know you're at this company, but I'm, I'm going to be on the other side of the argument here. I'm going to be on like the tech bro, like let's automate everything side just so I can better understand. Like, I think it's going to be like the horses and the cars. Like we still take the kids to horse lessons. We still mm-hmm. go horseback riding. We still do that. We do it, you know, they do it weekly. I go with them once a month or, or something of that nature. But we also have the four wheelers, right? So we do that. And it's just, we, we do different things. We, we like to experience the different things. And one of the things we like to do is movies. Um, it's it's funny because when we're talking, you're using like we're, we're scared or we're fear or whatever. I'm surprised that you're not like, hey, 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 guys, like at your board meeting, like, let's be the ones to make the box. Like, let's let's use all of our revenue to make the box. Yeah. Because it's coming. Pre- it, it is. And, and it's um, it is it is it is certainly on our radar. And we certainly realized that the, cause you mentioned you mentioned, you know, um, intake of all this content, especially, you know, going back two decades, right? I sat down and I watched, you watched sitcoms, right? And they were mm-hmm. very low production value. And so the movie was the big thing. I mean, I've seen some YouTube videos and some 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 content creators that can create some pretty phenomenal stuff, um, as well as all these other things. Now you have such an, abu- and, and not only that, what you were watching back then was, okay, it's seven o'clock. I need to, I need to go watch this show because that's the only time I can watch it. Whereas now, whether it's a movie or a TV show or whatever, like I can do it literally on demand, obviously, but at any time, at any, at any size screen. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is certainly on our radar and it's certainly a scary thing to see how it's going to change. Right. Um, and I think it really changes with the consumer, the kids that are, you know, our kids age, my kids are, are six and uh, 11, as they grow up, what I mean, they're not going to grow up as much as we did saying, oh, when we went to the theater, like that was a fun event. I can remember the very first movie I ever saw was Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And I remember it to this day. I remember my reaction to seeing Jurassic Park and all that. They're not going to have that, right? I mean, they've had YouTube and iPads and just so much content throughout their lives. They're not going to remember that. And they don't. we don't go near as often. Um, and it's such a different experience. Um, but what's interesting about that too, is the, the amount of content that's coming out, the amount of seats in, in cities, right? That's a big piece of it. The, the, the number of theaters in a specific area isn't as much. We've taken out all of our seats, all of our stadium seating. And now there are all these big recliners Amazing, and all that, by the way, that was the best thing to awesome. happen. Yeah. And we have the best cause they have little heaters, you know, a little Ooh. button to keep your, uh, your, uh, backside warm. But as you do that, you lose like 40, 50, 60 percent of your seats. So now a town, now a geographic area that had, you know, however many seats, 10,000 seats in the market now may only have 5,500. Well, now the studio is trying to figure out how to make up that revenue, right? You as the, as the exhibitor might be doing okay because you're going to sell more. The price is going to be higher for that ticket. Um but you don't have as many butts in the seat. And so the studio is now not getting as much money. And now they're taking it, looking at like, wow, how do we handle this? And so I do think, I do think, I say all that to say this, that over time, and, and, and I have seen this, this has happened uh, as an industry, you know, because of everything with COVID, things were going straight to in-home, but 
over over the last three years, I think these streaming services have kind of realized that it's not a great revenue model to send it straight to Disney Plus or whatever for lots of different reasons. A, you're not getting as many tickets. People aren't seeing it multiple times. You know, you're, you're paying the same price. And so I think that what they've realized is we can put it into the theater and then after 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is, 45 days, put it into – you know, on demand, video on demand and streaming services in the home. I think it's kind of falling into a, a nice um, kind of uh, a piece where everybody can kind of play along, right, and get get their kind of piece of it. Uh, but there for a while, it was really scary. And I do think that over time, it's it'll have, we'll have to see how it works itself out. But you also used to see companies build 24 plexes and mm-hmm. these massive theaters with these these tons of auditoriums. We don't have the content for that anymore, right? You don't have, especially this year coming up, you don't have a new movie coming out every weekend. You, you've got a couple, but over the next three months, frankly, this first quarter of 2024, it's kind of thin. Uh-huh. And so we're kind of freaking out a little bit that as an industry. So nobody's building those those megaplexes anymore. We've got locations that have six, th- six auditoriums. We're building new locations that have six, seven auditoriums as opposed to uh, our big one has 14, right? You just... You, there's no reason to have that meeting anymore. And so for less content, uh, for less people in the building, I can still fill up my building. And that's what's adding these other things into your building becomes such a critical piece to success and, and, and making as much money as you can off one consumer that walks in the door. Right. I mean, that's the key now at this point. So it, it is a revolving, uh, ever changing industry. Um, but everything we went through with COVID, I think right now we're all just kind of like, let's just, get back and coast for a little while and we'll see what happens in the future. Yeah. It sounds scary. Uh, <laughs> what's the, what's the, the vibe there in the industry are like, is everybody blinded by nostalgia and this is just like what we like to do and we just want it to make it work. Or are there people that are stepping back outside of it and saying, look, this is what's coming. Obviously we, there's a model for it which is the I, the horse and the cars, I think is like the best model because we still it's still an industry. There's still money there. People still go do it and they spend money. It's just a scale. It's a lot scaled down. So are there people out there saying like, look, we obviously are on this down curve and it's going to be scaled down. And so let's like prepare for that future. Obviously, you're kind of doing it a little bit by building smaller theaters, right? But yep. also... Why not be the one to to build the thing you know is going to crush you? Yeah. Um, is it because you can't I be had, that guy at the trade association? You get tomatoes thrown at you? Oh, you would get annihilated. Yeah, you'd be ostracized pretty quickly. Um, I think, you know, most people in this industry, what's interesting is it is a very, um, I don't want to say archaic, is that as a negative connotation, but it is a very um, kind of old school industry, right? And you have these, I mean, first off, the majority of the theaters in the country, I'll say the majority, probably the majority, are are owned by the big three, right? The big three companies that I won't that I won't mention, but um, and so they would put a stop to it pretty quickly. And their hands are and and their relationships with the studios are, are pretty close. So it's the kind of situation where they could do it. I guarantee you they could do it. But if somebody, a small company like us, were to go try to do it, it would be uh, shut down pretty quick, and you'd get you would get some tomatoes thrown at you, and you'd probably be kicked out of that association. But um, you know, I don't know if that's ever coming or not. And certainly it certainly has to think. But but again, though, I think the I think the, the, the bigger companies that have hundreds of locations, right, they probably are a little scared because mm-hmm. it's not as easy to pivot, especially if they're public. Right. It's not as easy to pivot for them. When we were going through COVID, we were trying to figure out what we could if we were to knock out half of our, our auditoriums, what could we do with these spaces? Right. And now pickleball and all this other stuff yeah. and go-karts, all these new things are, are these new fads that for us as a small company, we have nine locations. We could easily do that, right? And we could pivot that much for lots of different reasons. They can't. And so for them, it probably is. And not to mention, look at all the all the ones that have gone bankrupt and they've had to shut down. Literally hundreds across the country have been shut down and that affects, that's bad for the industry. It's good for us in some markets and we've benefited from that. But as an industry, that's that's not a great thing, right? That's that's less butts in the seat. And then that makes that conversation with the studios a little trickier, right? Because now it's maybe the terms aren't as good or maybe they're having to charge you more because most people don't realize we give away sometimes as much as 65 or 70% of every single ticket to the studios. They That's oh, their wow. money. So we keep a small portion of it. Have you ever wondered why concessions are so expensive? 
Uh, I said, yeah. that's where we make our money. <laughs> that's what that's I That's where figured. we make our money. You know, traditionally, I mean, now obviously we've expanded into these other areas, but um, yeah, I have a feeling that those bigger companies, I know they are, that they are reeling to try to figure out what's next, right? And and people like us who are innovating some of these other entertainment options, nobody's nobody's going to build another movie theater. I'll, I'll, well, don't quote me on this. That's just a theater, right? Popcorn, soda, yeah. go see your movie. Now, Why do that when you can food and beverage and all these other things? Are the are they digital? The cinemas like is it coming to some box like at the? Are they mailing yeah. tape? Like what are they doing? All of the above. So yes, um, well not not necessarily film anymore. So what ha- you know back when I started in 1999, we strung up the projectors with with mm-hmm. film, right? And then there was a uh, – the studios really wanted us to go digital. But, again, you're talking these small exhibitors didn't have millions of dollars to convert their auditorium. So they did kind of a, a partner program where they 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 bought it and then you put it in and then you paid them back over, over a long period of time. And it was a whole program. So at this point, the entire industry, unless you're some super specific nostalgia theater, is all digital. Um, everything is digital. The content – comes in from satellite the majority of the time it's satellite although they can still mail us hard drives if that um doesn't work but there's a whole content delivery network that comes in via satellite over the course of of a few days in advance and then there's a license that we get delivered um 24 to 48 hours before and then we kind of marry the two together and the content becomes available to uh to be sent to each individual uh projector and then there's a server there i mean it's actually an unbelievably complicated process but it's all digital now and then now we're going through this transition of the old xenon big xenon bulbs and now we're going strictly laser projectors right and that's kind of in this transition period of again a major cost and rehab to switch from xenon to um to digital to uh, laser projection so if i wanted to well to first question is do these boxes exist for wealthy people I have no idea. The answer is yes, I, because I can just I would buy not a movie be theater. Surprised. I can just well, I, yeah. That was my next question is how much does it need how many how much money do I need to spend to license as a movie theater so I get the rights to be able to do this? If I have a one location movie theater. So you theater. would have to jump through a lot of hoops and mm-hmm. a lot of paperwork, like we talked about, yeah. um, for the studio to send it to you. Is it possible? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but it would it would be it would be a lot, probably. Now, does your first question is, does it exist for the for the mega wealthy? Probably, yeah. There, yeah. There's probably some people out there that have a feeling um, that are way up the chain that could that could do it, but um, it would take a lot. Yeah, it would take a lot. Yeah, because I, there's somebody out there that's like, hey, if Shaq wants it in his theater at home, he's gonna get I it in his theater so. at home. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I would think so. Yeah. So then, how do I become Shaq? I'm a <laughs> Uh, get a lot of championship rings and uh, and be on yeah. TV. No, I don't know. I mean, it would it is it is a process because you actually have to kind of go through. There's a whole process to kind of get connected to each studio because you we still deal with the studios directly. We work with a buyer who calls the studios and negotiates terms. I mean, there's there's and then the delivery piece. I mean, and then the technology to get it from from the servers that are it's downloaded to or or the ingestion point and then to the each projector it's it's a lot so of technology. So you negotiate specific deals for movies? We do. Yeah. Why are why we are go- they even playing that game? Why are why aren't they just saying, "Hey, we'll negotiate with the three big guys and everyone else just gets this one rate or you die." Why are they playing the game? Cuz they can. Yeah. I mean, you're you I mean, you're exactly right. We've been asking these questions for years at our trade association, but the reality is the big three have in the top 10 probably have that kind of pool. Whereas with us, for the most part, you know, not to take anything away from our bookers, but for the most part, they say, here's the rate you're going to get. What, what, there's nothing we can do about it. But if you're one of the big ones, I can say, they can say, here's the rate you're going to get. And then they can say, well, we're not going to show it because we don't like that rate. Well, that takes a big chunk out of the revenue of the studio. So they're going to work it out. But for us, they don't care. I mean, okay, don't show it in your nine locations. We'll do something else. So it's it's kind of a set rate. And then there's a ramp down period, right? I mean, you pay a different rate the third, fourth, fifth, sixth week. Um, but it's always gonna for the most part be in the favor of the studios. They 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 hold the content. I mean, they they hold the um they take all the risk, frankly. I'm right, they're the ones creating the the movie. 
And so we don't really have a whole lot of negotiation power as an individual. As an individual, our trade association can't really negotiate individual rights on our behalf. Um, so it's, you know, you're kind of stuck. What are you going to do? Wow. Well, you could do the Elon Musk move and just buy the top three. <laughs> I don't know if you'd be able to get that deal from the government. Uh, yeah, the DOJ might have a problem yeah, with that. Yeah, they might have a problem yeah. with that. We'd buy <laughs> one of them and then just be the one that does the box. Wait, yes. Do you know what happened with Sean? You said Sean Parker. I actually, um, I interviewed Napster. you know Napster still exists? I interviewed them. They got have, bought by have, a cryptocurrency. <laughs> I've looked it up several times over the last yeah. few years. Yeah, there was still some sort of entity, but... Um, I really don't know what happened. I think, I swear, I think it was before COVID and it must have just tanked. And it was, he was, it was an uphill battle. Don't get me wrong, but he was trying to be innovative, right? I mean, it was going to be, we were, we were scared. I mean, it was going to be a big deal. And for all I know, it's still out there. I have no idea, frankly, but it was, it's been a couple of years since I've heard anything out of it. Josh, is it still out there? Josh is going to look up while we're talking. Cause look again, that doesn't mean I'm not going to go to the movies, but you have kids. Yeah. Oh, wait, there it is. There it is. It w- what's funny is that it, I have a feeling it was probably pressed pretty hard because it, in 2017, the studios having their own video on demand services really wasn't a thing, right? Um, or at least it hadn't been made public. And so I have a feeling about that time, Disney Plus was ramping up, Paramount Plus was coming out, or uh, uh, Peacock and Paramount and all that. So I have a feeling, especially now, they'd have a hard time getting something that like that going because – the behemoth in the room is Disney, right? They control a lot of this. And so I have a feeling they'd have a, they would have a lot to say about somebody trying to uh, create an in-home box. But look at the people who are on the side of it. Spielberg, J.J. Abrams, Peter Jackson. They love the forward thinking. We need to get yeah. Sean on the show. Josh. And they also work for those, for those production companies too. So I know. Of course they're going to fight it. Every industry, it's the... Uh, the death spends or whatever. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the that would be the ultimate disruption. There's no doubt about that. I mean, and we've been through this multiple times, and certainly through COVID, through all these streaming services. So that would be there. There would have to be some sort of from a from a as an industry side, there'd have to be some sort of of uh, you know what we call a window, right? So traditionally, if you think about it, back when you were growing up, when things would before it would show up in Blockbuster, it would be six, nine plus months, right? Until you could rent the movie. Uh, well now with, with post COVID it's could be, could be day and date. So they come out at the same time, could be a matter of weeks, could be as 30 or 45 days. So there'd have to be some sort of window. Um, yeah. Why are I they doing imagine. that? Why do they dual release? Sometimes it's it, like, what was a movie? We actually chose to watch the movie that was streaming at home instead of going to the theaters because yep. There were two movies released. We wanted to see both movies. The kids were sick, and they uh, one of the movies was released streaming. You pay like thirty or forty bucks for it, but like, wh- why are they? How are they making these decisions? It really comes down to the studio. I mean, I, I would imagine it's just a major financial decision, right? I mean, again, and and why I don't know, but but I can tell you this: I know that if something, if for instance, if Netflix wants to put something out the same time it goes in the theater, they're, they're paying big money for it or Amazon or whoever it is. So it's strictly a financial decision. If they look at the outlook and say, I mean, every week we know when a movie comes out and it's usually pretty darn close, how many tens of millions of dollars it's going to make. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I read earlier that mean girls is coming out this week and it's, it's, uh, looking at $33 million. Well, it's going to be somewhere in that. And so if it costs and they're going to look at it and say, well, gosh, it makes sense to, put it on Netflix or put it on this streaming service in seven, 14, 21 days or whatever it is. And they'll pay us this. It's, it's totally a financial decision at that point. Recoup some of that cost of production and, and, and marketing. It's interesting. The history has been find the gatekeepers, destroy the gatekeepers and technology is the weapon in which we're doing that. Yep. Yeah. But every day I get to look in all these different industries, for example, the docks that we have, the ports. Mm-hmm. Remember when those backups were happening? Yeah. Well, I did all I did all this like investigative myself research on it. So it turns out that there are fully autonomous ports, like ninety nine percent autonomous ports. There's some humans there. We don't let those into the U.S. because the unions don't let them into the oh, U.S. Oh sure. Oh, so I can we imagine. prevent us from having highly functional 
competitive ports because of a union group that's like it's going to take the humans jobs so that's yep. that's really in, these little case studies are interesting because right they're happening before it's like super political right because the idea of like humans and robots is going to become obviously a huge right. political point in the future but there's not AI too much not energy helping, yeah. around it Exactly. There's not a crazy amount of bipartisan stuff with the AI right now. Everybody just is kind of like, hey, what's going on with that? Um, but it will get crazy, I'm sure. But we can look back to these times when it, when we do have these situations where we're successfully preventing technology from existing to keep jobs. Like those case studies exist. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. I, and that is, I mean, again, the entire industry, we view it as we being the industry. Um, the trade association, especially right. I mean, we've we've had conversations where the 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 uh, CEOs of a of a studio is up on stage at a at a at a conference, and he says the same thing, right? We are all in this together, right? It's a partnership, and if you start to take a cut one of the legs out, I mean, the whole thing starts to crumble. And so, you got to think about it. the studios. Yes, you could absolutely send it straight, you know, to the home and and cut out. But you're going to lose half your theaters. I mean, most of the small exhibitors, and frankly, a lot of the bigger ones, probably are more susceptible than even the small guys for for lots of different reasons. They're gonna they're gonna have a hard time making money, and then that changes everything, and it's just the domino effect. And then the studio's not making enough money. So, and we saw that during COVID with with everything going straight to the home, um, it they don't make as much money. I mean, if you read the articles, Disney Plus lost billions of dollars in its first year for the same reason. So let's put it straight to the theater, give it however many days or weeks, and then put it to uh, streaming and you kind of, there's a, there's a way it can all works, but whoever that disruptor is, I mean, that would be a big deal, but the way the industry is set up, you'd have a hard time getting that kind of going because the studios want that. Now the studios that, that don't necessarily care about it is the Netflixes and the Amazons of the world that don't have that footprint. They don't have the footprint in the, in the, in the uh, exhibitor anyways, in that, that traditional exhibitor space. So they don't care. So it'll, it'll be something like that. And they've done it. I mean, they do it all the time. They things make that amazing are, Things content. that would be – oh, and it would do so, – some of the movies – it's actually really frustrating because some of the movies would do unbelievably well. I don't – what was the um, – during COVID, there was one that – with Tom Hanks or something. The um, mm-hmm. the Irishman, I think it was, went straight to, to streaming. And it was one of the big ones that would have done amazing, right, in the in the theaters. But at the time – COVID was still a, a big issue and, and, it, and it probably wouldn't have made as much money. But if that came out now, I, I doubt they would have done that, right? They would absolutely send it, send it to the theater, make your, you know, 70, 80, $100 million, go overseas and then bring it into streaming. It's all a financial decision from their side. That's interesting. Well, we have such amazing content from, do they ever take it where the Amazon, I think Amazon had a movie with Mark Wahlberg that was Real funny, where he was like a spy, but his family didn't know or something. I yeah. saw it a couple of weeks ago, but it was on, I think, Prime. Do they ever take Prime stuff and then let it play in the movie theaters, and so they can make more money? Yeah, there have been limited runs. I mean, there there is an Amazon Studio that I mean, we've had movie. There was a movie with um, several years ago because we we did a sneak of it or something um, where Amazon Studio put it out first run, but. I don't know if they've just they're just it's not as as often it's not as prevalent but but they certainly do it yeah I mean and again that was probably before Prime Video was a huge thing certainly on the on the apps and everything it, maybe there was a video piece but um, you don't see it as much anymore for them you know they have such in Netflix too I mean they could it's all about subscribers at that point so I, I don't know the economics behind it but they certainly could do it and, and they do it but not as much as you would think. The previews have changed a lot at movies over the years. You see all sorts of stuff based off different theaters that I go to. What are you guys doing that subscription thing at your theater? What do you mean? Like, do you let people buy a subscription, like a monthly subscription to your movie theater? Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. So we just launched a membership program January 1st. Um, and, and there's depending, we have three different kind of tiers of theaters, right? You have traditional theaters. We have kind of our food and beverage ones where you sit down and a, we used to be a waiter would come to you, but it's strictly, um, strictly movies and food, uh, that you sit down in the auditorium. And then we have what we call the FEC or a cinema entertainment center where it's 
bowling and video games and axe throwing and escape rooms. So there's three different tiers. Ooh, and then that in one each, sounds fun. Yeah, and so in, in each kind of tier, you've got two or three different tiers of gold or platinum. But basically, yeah, you pay on average, you know, 16, 17 bucks and you'll get two movie tickets and then a couple tickets at a flat rate and a 10% discount on concessions. And if it's one of our FEC locations, you get our game cards or a token for some sort of VR or something like that. But our, our big locations, they have all those kind of amenities. And so it makes a ton of sense to pay. If you're going to go to the theater once a quarter, absolutely. The membership makes all the, all the sense in the world. And because we have all these other offerings, you know, some of the other ones that it's just movies, if you go once a quarter or something, the numbers may not make sense. But if you get all that additional stuff for us, it makes all the difference in the world to come to us and to be a subscriber. And so we launched it literally 10 days ago, app, oh, web, and, and fully integrated to everything in the in the centers that, uh, that have it. Yep. You mentioned earlier something about people seeing movies multiple times. People watch movies multiple times. Do they go to the theater and will like watch the same movie twice while it's playing? Uh, you see that sometimes. What I was kind of okay. referring to was the ability to have it streaming, right? I mean, that was the, the oh, video okay. on demand side of saying, um, you know, but but we do have that. I mean, we have you have these these followings of people that are just movie buffs, and they've come in. You know, back back in the day, we used to do like um, uh, marathons, right? Like when Star Wars would come out, we would show all all the Star Wars movies and people would come to all that. I mean, you'd be surprised at how much our loyalty program as a whole is massive people. And to keep in mind, also we're in smaller markets for the most part, we're in these tertiary markets or, uh, you know, we're in a couple big ones out a little outside of Chicago, Charlotte, Tulsa are a little bit different, but the other markets are, we own the entertainment space in those, in those facilities, in those cities. So our loyalty following is pretty high. So it's not uncommon for people to come in multiple times a month to see something. Now, how much content we have can certainly drive that, but Hollywood does a, does a great job of marketing their own movie. So we kind of focus from a marketing standpoint of the other things in the building. We let we let Hollywood market it. They do a great job and spend all that money. And and how did you get involved in this? Are you a, are you a partner at the company or like what's your position there? No, so I'm the CTO at Synergy. Uh, I have been in the industry since 1999. Actually, the owners of this company were my first bosses. I had I had barely turned 16. October of 99, they opened their very first theater in small town, Granbury, Texas. And that's where I grew up. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to go work at the theater. That was the biggest thing that happened to the town in, gosh, probably decades, right? We were getting a six-screen movie theater. And I was sweeping up popcorn, right? Just, just a lowly employee. And over the course of several years, I worked there, made it to the projection booth. Uh, there's a a food and beverage type um, company that that he started in 2001 called the Movie Tavern, which is still around today, um, owned by Marcus. And he we started we the owners started that company in 2001. I became the IT director there in 2002 after I graduated high school. He sold it in 2007 or eight, um, and then I started my own IT company in 2009. And Synergy, where I am now, was my they were my one of my first clients. And so I've been involved in this company for since 2009. I sold my IT company in 2015 to my partner and came over here full time. So for almost nine years, I've been here as the CTO at Synergy. When I came on board, we had two locations and now we have nine. Nice. So I've so been in the growing. industry for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, it is growing. It's 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 interesting to see the progression of the industry as a whole, uh, in a lot of different ways, COVID obviously played a big part of, of where we are now, but even from a technology standpoint, right? I mean, the industry was so stagnant for a hundred years, right? People were still printing off tickets and tearing tickets. Even when I started, we didn't, we didn't take credit cards or anything back then. And so now because we're kind of being forced into it, we've become as an industry incredibly technology focused around the digital projection and the sound systems have become amazing, obviously, um, and then everything else in the building and the ability to try to keep the guest in the building as long as we can and make that process as easy as possible. That's what kind of makes us different in that we've spent all this time and all this money and all this effort to create all these technologies to make that customer journey as easy, as smooth as possible. And you mentioned the membership program, right? I mean, that's kind of a big deal um, across the industry. We're the first ones to do it that incorporates movies 
and the FEC side, right? The entertainment space all in one kind of very smooth, clean customer experience and customer journey. We're kind of the first ones to do that. And that's just in an effort to to do it, to keep people in and get people in and keep get them off their couch from all this other stuff that we've been talking about, right? I mean, that's that's what we're up against. And that's that's what's constantly driving innovation in this industry, which again, for the first hundred years was almost nothing. How early do you get the movies before they actually release? So what's funny is when I started, we used to get them like a week in advance. And as a projectionist, I'd have to build it put it on the on the projector I mean it was a, it was an incredible system the old way and we would get it about a week in advance so we would absolutely we had to watch it right you had to build it reel to reel and everything so you had to make sure it was good now we get it days or more in advance but the license key doesn't actually unlock it until the day of so maybe maybe around midnight or overnight we can you could get a sneak peek if you were to be able to do it and to be able to watch it but for the most part, it's it's pretty well locked down it, and it's monitored and pretty closely. So they've got a pretty good handle on on keeping it secure. Yeah, I was looking at the technology, the anti-piracy technology, where yep. they will in, embed t- different types of codes and things into all the different individual streams so they can see where it was pirated from. That's yep. That's the I have I've I've been told that I've never seen it, but the, supposedly there is ways that they can track it down to what auditorium it came or a, a theater it came out of. Should they come across it for sure yeah i don't know where i watch i think i watched a video about that on youtube but that was essentially they would sprinkle in these like what was it i can't remember exactly what it was but they had a way of doing it and they would make it unique for each of the streams that they sent out and that way they could tell exactly where it came from yeah i believe it absolutely they've got it they've got they run a pretty tight ship on that side of it they keep it pretty well locked down and the problem is is if you get it at the last minute and there's an issue for whatever reason right a license key doesn't work or something it doesn't work and so that causes mass chaos in your auditorium does that happen it can yeah i mean it's happened happened? yeah i mean again the the back end systems are, are unbelievably complex um partially unnecessarily so in a lot of ways um and so, you know, just like anything else, things get corrupted, right? You're 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 sending a lot of data from a satellite down. It downloads it. It's got some checks, make sure it's not corrupt, and then it's going from that server to another server, and then from that server to a projector server, and then it's got to send it to the obviously onto the screen. I mean, things happen. Absolutely, things happen. it happens. Yeah, we had an issue um, at one of our theaters, maybe in Charlotte, just within the last couple of weeks, where. A, a file got corrupt and you've just got to, you've got to re-download it or resend it to the projector. And that takes, you know, I mean, these things are tens of, of to, to a hundred gigs or whatever the size is. It takes time and, yeah. and you've got people sitting in an auditorium. So it's, it certainly happens. It's, it's not a fun experience. Uh, if you're the manager on duty, I can assure you of that. Yeah, that does not sound like a fun, we had a, uh, last time we were at, or, Two or three times ago, we were at a movie theater and the AC or the heat broke. And I was like, oh, no. That happens yeah, too, that happens. especially in Texas. Yes, yes. Well, this was fantastic, my friend. I'll let you know when I'm out there and then we'll have the episode released next week. Okay.